What is up, everyone? Welcome to Above Ground Podcast. Above Ground Podcast, because you can't serve below. What is going on out there? Uh, Today is Veterans Day, so Tim and I wanted to give all our veterans a big virtual audio hug and say thank you for your sacrifice, for your heroism, and your service Because of you, we are free and uh, we're safe. And we have the best military in the world. Uh, There's not many people out there who don't either have a relative serving, having served, or know someone who is serving or has served. So if you know a vet, thank the vets. Thank them everywhere. Thank them from all, all ages, man, all ages. So... Today is Veterans Day, and this episode is going to be awesome. But first, I wanted to tell you about a very special collaboration. That's right. Close Knit Company of Naples, Florida is a screen printing company. And Dan and Natalie make tees, tanks, crops, sweatshirts, hoodies. They make some cool stuff, man. Uh, They've got some awesome collections on their website, closeknitco.com. They have collections for dog lovers, adventure lovers, Jeep lovers. Uh, They have a Be the Change donation T-shirt that they're making now. And in 2021, they are going to be the screen printer for Above Ground Podcast. That's right, people. We got some gear coming And uh, we're so excited about it. I cannot wait to see what we get done. And you'll be able to support the show uh, because we need your support. We really do. We need you to star, scribe, and share the podcast so people can find it. But better yet, I'd love to see you wearing T-shirts when we get them done. So in the upcoming weeks, we'll be giving you some more information about that. So stay tuned. Uh, Now today's episode... um, Today's episode is a very special one, and uh, just to, so you know, uh, you're going to hear about uh, sexual trauma. You're going to hear about a lot of things today that um, we don't normally get to talk about all the time here on Above Ground Podcast, but um, wow. Uh, today's episode is an interview with our guest, Katie Fisher McVeigh. And she is a retired Air Force veteran, and she is an incredible woman, uh, strong, resilient. And she's actually going to share her story for the very first time anywhere. Uh, I've known Katie now for a few years. She's become a very good friend of mine. She was my board chair when I first got on the board for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, Capital Region Chapter, and she's become a good friend. Uh, She's an awesome person. And uh, I'm so very proud to be able to call her my friend. So nobody puts Katie in a corner. Disclaimer. The hosts of this podcast, Timothy Patrick and Will Foley, are by no means professionals. However, having lived experience with mental illness themselves, they have gained useful perspectives on common mental health issues that some of us struggle to overcome on a daily basis. By sharing their stories, they hope to create connection. By creating connection, they hope to help you find your purpose. And through purpose, we can all begin to build the foundations for positive mental health. This is the Above Ground Podcast. Are you ready to lace up your boots, throw up your horns, and jump into the pit? Then let's stomp the stigmas of mental illness. It's time for Above Ground Podcast. Now, Will Foley and Timothy Patrick. What is up, everyone? Welcome to Above Ground Podcast. Above Ground Podcast, because you can't serve below. I am joined this morning by my good friend TPP. You down with TPP? Yeah, you know me. Uh, what's up, Timmy? How we doing this week, brother? We're doing. We're doing. We are. We are vertical and we are breathing, and um, for the most part, we are pretty healthy. So, I, I I can't really complain too much. Dude, we're above ground. That's the we're above part. ground. That's the important part. I'm still. I'm still. I'm still. Um, I'm still coming down from Friday night. You know, got to hang out with the fam. Got to hang out with. Um, Fernando. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, 
because this is our Veterans Day episode this morning, and uh, we got a special one. But uh, a few weeks ago, the day that we're recording this interview, actually, uh, just so everybody knows, put a little context to it. Uh, I had a, an event Friday night uh, through the National Alliance of Mental Illness, which I got to perform for uh, Chris Cornell's daughter, Lily Cornell Silver. She was uh, receiving an award through NAMI for her uh, awareness and her TV, her Instagram program, Mind Wide Open. And the video came out on Friday and uh, we had a we had a little watch party at my house. Pizza, wings, cats, cats. <laughs> or a cat, I should say anyway. But uh, so, yeah, like I said, this is our Veterans Day episode. And uh, today is very special because I have a good friend of mine with us this morning. Uh, her name is Kate Fisher McVay. She is actually the former board chair of uh, the Capital Region Chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. But more importantly, she is a vet. She is an Air Force vet, and she is a wonderful person. She is uh, super cool and deserves tiaras and and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she, is, uh, she, is, she, is, uh, she is amazing but she has she has an amazing story to share with you and uh from what i understand this is the first time she's told her story and uh, i'm i can't say how how grateful and honored i am to have her with us and to have her share her story and to have everyone hear it and kate thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for being willing to do this and and put on display your, your, your badge of honor. Thank you, um, Will and Tim so much for inviting me to, to speak today. You know, when Will asked me to be the Veterans Day guest, I was both honored and slightly terrified. You know, that <laughs> feeling of what am I going to talk about? Do I talk about the numbers? And we all know them. You know, we lose 22 veterans a day, 22 too many. And after some thought, I decided to tell you my story, a story I've never told to the masses. So you'll have to forgive me that it's not very polished, but I think it'll help people understand the barriers that so many veterans feel when it comes to getting mental health care and the struggles that come with it. And last but not least, overcoming them. Um, so as Will said, I'm a retired Air Force veteran. I spent five years active duty and 15 years as a reservist. In 1997, which feels like a lifetime ago, but also like yesterday in this story's context, I was sexually assaulted. I was 19 years old, stationed in the middle of the country, and I was scared. I had done everything right. I had notified my command. I pressed charges. Um, he was also a military member, well-liked and with a lot more rank than me. And with that came a whole host of issues and threats and just an incredibly challenging time. I was mandated into counseling on base. So barrier number one, I walked into her office, had never done therapy before. And she asked me what I wanted. And I told her, I just wanted to go home. Her response, and I remember it so clearly was, we all want to go home, Airman Fisher. And at that moment, I realized in my 19 year old brain, adapt and overcome, suck it up and press on. And during the investigation, my perpetrator died. And that reinforced my thinking. It was over and I needed to get over it. And moving through the years, I wore it like a badge of honor. I was a rape survivor and I did it on my own, but I didn't, I buried it. Fast forward 20 years, and I'm sitting in a class on military sexual trauma. I had attended actually to get resources for vets I was working with. And I'm getting really pissed off listening to this panel of women talk. I'm thinking, this is all you got? That's nothing compared to what happened to me. And I knew this was wrong. Why am I mad at these women? Why am I judging them? I walked out struggling with those competing thoughts. I knew I should be empathetic, but I was so far from that. And I knew I needed to address it. But barrier number two, I was still in the military. I didn't want to get med boarded, lose my career. I was so close to retirement. So I waited. And all of those feelings were back. That fear, anger, nightmares, frustration, anxiety. 
but I didn't feel I could address it yet. I actually retired. And then I reached out to the clinician at the VA, VA that had hosted that conference. And I started my PTSD journey at that point. I'll call it a journey because it is. Anyone in mental health care knows this. There's ups and downs, there's good days and bad. And barrier number three for many is the VA. You know, I'm lucky, I have a great therapist. It's not easy, it's still not easy, but I've learned a lot. I know my trauma affected my life, my relationships, my everything, my parenting. I drank like it was my job for many years. And therapy became, you know, not looking to feel better for me, but looking for those aha moments where I would recognize some of my behaviors and the reasons for them, all of which I could work to change. And I say work because therapy is work, but it's worth it. So if you have someone in your life who's resistant to reaching out to the VA, they're not the only clinicians out there. There are others who can help. If they have TRICARE, there are other providers in the area. If they have no insurance, there are still providers. They don't have to go this alone. You know, there's peer programs, online groups. There are so many supports and we need to normalize using them. One of the reasons I started getting involved in community programs like AFSP was to let veterans know they aren't alone. You know, it was really healing for me to help others, but that too has its complications. You know, I think we need to become really aware of where we are at. Will once said to me that he was riding the struggle bus. And I thought that was such a perfect example of self-awareness. We're not always okay. And that's okay. Being able to verbalize that to someone is a huge relief. Whether that be a friend, a family member, a group or a clinician, find your person. The one that can hold space for you and sit comfortably with you in those moments because they happen. You know, for me, I'm not an overly spiritual person, but my go-to is my brother's cemetery plot. I go and I just let it all out. And I was so good at compartmentalizing absolutely everything. I felt nothing for a really long time. And that has its benefits for sure, but it also takes so much away. You know, I remember after an AFSP event, I had stood on stage and spoke to over 2000 people. I wore the best mask. I left that event you know, and went straight to the cemetery. If you looked at me, you'd think I had it all together, but I was so far from that. You know, I went to the cemetery, I laid on Michael's grave and I begged him to give me strength to stay because I didn't want to be here anymore. And I felt a huge weight lifted off of me, you know, just admitting I could no longer hold it together brought me relief. We need to break that stigma. You know, we need to be able to be vulnerable. And for a veteran and many others, you know, that's one of the hardest things. So check in on your wingman, your battle buddy, your brothers in arms. And if you need help, reach out. We can't lose anymore. So I wanted to share this manifesto by Brene Brown. She is an author. She's a clinician. She's a speaker. She does amazing TED Talks. And I always keep it nearby. And I think it's a great way to kind of wrap up my story. There is no greater threat to the critics and cynics and fear mongers than those of us who are willing to fall because we have learned how to rise. With skinned knees and bruised hearts, we choose owning our stories of struggle over hiding, over hustling, over pretending. When we deny our stories, they define us. When we run from struggle, we are never free. So we turn toward truth and look it in the eye. We will not be characters in our stories, not villains, not victims, not even heroes. We are the authors of our lives. We write our own daring endings. We craft love from heartbreak, compassion from shame, grace from disappointment, courage from failure. Showing up is our power. Story is our way home. Truth is our song. We are the brave and brokenhearted. We are rising strong. Wow. Um, first of all, it's such a show of strength and 
perseverance and resilience for you to share that and to know that this is the first time you've shared that is is an incredible incredible empowerment thing and i know you know this but wow i i, I don't know what to say but um but i just want to give you a big virtual hug um, <laughs> thank you i'm hugging you back will <laughs> I agree. I agree real quick. I agree with it. Will, you said it perfectly, you know, resilience, they're, they're all there. Um, courage, strength. And what I, I, I always, I'm a big fan of, of, you know, getting back up, watching people rise back up and, and that's what you've done and what you continue to do. So um, I'm a big fan of that for sure. Thank you, Tim. Well, you know, and it's funny, I was as reading that Brene Brown piece, you know, story is our way home kind of just hit me again. And being able to share your story and you guys giving me that opportunity today, I, I really appreciate that because it's, it's part of my growth and it's part of my journey. And so thank you for that. Thank you. I, I have to ask sort of, I kind of want to go back to the beginning a little bit because okay. there's obvious obviously you were 19 in, in the military. So you went into the military right out of high school. I was 17. Yep. Were you really? Wow. So you weren't even out of, were you, were you graduated? At that I point? had graduated, but my parents did have to sign the paperwork in order for me to go in. So yeah, did I was you, 17. Did you go in to, to get away or did you go in as a way to like, what was your, what was your, my motivation. Yeah. What was the motivation to go in in the first place and serve? Um, I'm the daughter of a Vietnam veteran combat vet. And oh, so I okay. always kind of grew up, you know, I grew up in the <clears throat> going to the American Legion or the VFW with my dad and, and doing a lot of that stuff. And I always had that thought of service before self and being part of something bigger than you, you know, and so what better way to do that than to serve? Um, and so that was kind of that motivation. And I admittedly wasn't a school kid, you know, I mean, I graduated and I, I passed everything, but that wasn't my go-to. Um, and so I really, again, wanted to be a part of something bigger than myself. And that military gave me the ability to do that. Now, as the, as the daughter of a, of a combat vet, especially a Vietnam vet, I'm sure that there was, uh, a, was there a PTSD did your yes. dad live with PTSD following? Because as so many of them did. He and did. So and, you know, do. yeah, um, my dad lost his arm in Vietnam. Oh. Um, so, wow. you know, PTSD was was in our household. And as kids, you know, and back then it wasn't necessarily um, diagnosed. It was, oh, Mr. Fisher, you're just, you know, we're not sure what's going on. You know, when he'd take trips to the hospital. Um, and so... I saw it then, you know, I saw what he had struggled with and, and, you know, my dad's my hero. Um, and he was able to reach out and get help. And, you know, we all kind of had a better understanding of what to do when dad wasn't, you know, feeling his best and how to recenter him and refocus him. Um, so I was really aware of PTSD at a very young age. <laughs> wow. And he was you know? one of the, and he was one of the lucky ones that got to, that yeah. reached out and actually received help. Cause I mean, I, I've had some f very close friends who've had parents who um, were Vietnam vets that, you know, live, you could tell that, that it had caught up to them, you know, for years and that they struggled a lot. And it's, it's such a shame too, when you think about like, we talk about stigma, of mental health and mental illness, but when you talk about stigma of, of veterans, I mean, Vietnam vets are the, you know, that's that they are the poster children for stigma for sure, because so many of them were, were looked upon as bad people when they came back. And exactly. It was, you know, it's just, it's a shame, man. I mean, we had that stigma built into that whole thing, you know? And oh yeah, definitely. And you know, it's, it's interesting because I don't think my pop opened up about you know, Vietnam, like he would not talk to my brother and I about what happened there and what he saw and, and how he lost his arm. You know, as a kid, he told me he fed his arm to the sharks. And I told all my <laughs> friends that. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. 
you know, and when you have a dad with a hook, like dating is really entertaining. You know, so there was a, I can lot, of, a lot of a lot of great things, you know, and, and my pop was awesome. And and we are definitely a family of using humor as a defense mechanism. <laughs> like, That's you know, great. Built in really built in yeah, really young, you know. At, and, you're at the right um, place. Yeah. <laughs> so but you know, I think probably over the last 10 years, I finally like heard the story of when dad lost his arm, you know? And so he didn't really talk openly about it, but it, so it's that bottling up thing, right? We're going to bury it until it goes away and it really hasn't gone away. And we need to talk about how we're feeling. And, but it was really interesting as a, as a kid of, you know, having pop come home from going to the hospital and, you know, there's nothing wrong with him you know, it's all in his head. And so to be continuously told that, you know, it's all in your head, these anxieties and panic attacks is what technically it is all in your head, but technically right, but, it's all in but your no body help, too, because you're you know? living, you're yeah. living it every time you think about it, you're in that spot again. Right. Trauma affects your body, you know, yeah. and, and there's the body keeps the score. Yeah. That one of the, I read that book, you know, and <laughs> so it's, it's really pretty interesting. And, and so, yeah, I, you know, I learned about it really young. And I also learned how to be really resilient. You know, my pop is the, the most perfect example of resilience and stepping up and, and doing what you got to do to take care of yourself and your family. I think being, um, you know, what, what you guys both said earlier, just being like the vet and have that stigma on you. But then on top of it, being a man and then having it happen that, that long ago is also more weight that you, you got to look at that's thrown on because back then, you know, no one talked about it, whether it was man or woman, but then being right. a man, it was like, you know, suck it up, man up. This is, you well, know, being you in the military, family. dude, being in the military alone. Right. Already well, that's what I'm saying, but, on top, but, but even on top of being in the military, you actually have that on the outside. You know what I mean? You have that extra, 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 you know, extra toppings on your Sunday, so right. to speak. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big Sunday too, man. Oof. It's a big, it's a big Sunday to deal with. And you know, it, it's, but it's refreshing that he, um, you know, obviously, you know, knew enough to, you know, knew enough something, something was wrong and, and, you know, s- stood up for himself and got, got, got some help, you know? Right. So Kate, I, 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 I need to ask this question while I'm thinking about it. Uh, okay. So- So going into the military for you was a sort of a mandate that you sort of held because of your, of your childhood and your, and your dad and your dad being such a a big part of your life. How did, how did being in the military, being assaulted affect your view of service to your country? And did it, did it change your, did it change your mind about about being in the military did it hold do you, do you hold did you hold any grudges i'm sure you did and i don't mean and i don't mean it that no way. you I'm know holding it wrong but i i at nine o'clock really, in the morning i can't think of another word to say <laughs> it's an interesting question and you know it's funny like i think my father was more pissed off at the military like you need to come home because nothing good has happened to you there and i remember him saying that to me so he you was know, very supportive of this. Yeah, story. that's cool. Like, there was no, very cool. There was you no. Know, it was, yeah. And for me, it was this realization and kind of this eye-opening thing where, you know, people think like, oh, you're in the military. You must be A, B, and C. You're a good person. You're, you're there serving mm-hmm. your country. You know, people don't realize bad freaking people are in the military. Well, sure. You know? People go so, into the military for different reasons. Not everybody you know, is. Not everybody right. is is pushed into service, man. Some people Wait. are running away from problems. Some people are right, you know. So there's there's rapists, there's child molesters, there's you know all of that exists there. And I think for me at 19, that's what that eye opening was was like these aren't always good freaking people, you know. And and so, um, I became you know skeptical of a lot of things <laughs> at that time. My viewpoint changed on just human nature and human behavior and who people, who people really are, you know, just because you have a uniform on doesn't mean you're there to serve and protect, which of course we see way more now, but you know, at that age, you're, I was kind of blinded by, oh, they're all good people because they're here. Right. Um, 
And so that really changed my thought there. It was eye opening, you know, but I never necessarily held grudges against the military as a whole for counseling purposes. That was my first go with a counselor. I never wanted to talk to another counselor again. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I'm sure. Cause like, I, 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 okay. This was my first experience. And all I really remember about her is she made it a point to tell me she was Sydney Portier's niece. And I didn't even know who Sydney Portier was at that point in my life, yeah. you know, <laughs> Um, but how long did you see her for? I went twice oh, okay. <laughs> and I was, oh, I was done, you know, and, and then at that point, um, you know, my perpetrator had died. And so it was kind of like, all right, well, Airman Fisher's case is done, you know, like carry on, keep doing your job and doing what you have to do. We're not going to talk to you about this anymore. And, and not that I brought it up either. You know, I, I was as happy at that point to just bury it like okay press on move on i don't i don't want to deal with this anymore um, i got a question actually really quick go for it the just because i thought of it before but then you were just talking about it now like kind of stuffing it you know sweeping it under the rug so to speak whatever and um pressing on as you say how if you can give me some kind of idea as to like the time frame between that space between you know sweeping it under the rug and then having it kind of start to come out um you know physiologically i guess you could say even you know i think it came out i know it came out many times over the years and and for full disclosure i was raped on my birthday so that's not something Jesus. You, you know so happy birthday <laughs> like um every year you know it it rears its ugly head. Um, and so, um, you know, throughout the years it would come up and there would be situations, you know, if I'm in a bar and I'm drinking with people and all of a sudden you feel that anxiety of somebody's looking at you and, you know, all of those things were always there. But when it affected me the most was when, um, definitely that conference I went to, it was like that eye-opening experience. And then I had to order my medical records when I retired, because that's kind of the standard thing. You want your full medical record before you get out of the military. And I ordered it and I opened it and there's all my notes from my assault. Mm. And it was, holy shit, you know, just that holy shit moment of this is all here. And I, I guess throughout the years, I always knew it was there. And there would be instances where I could tell it was affecting me but you'd shove it back down, you know, uh -huh. oh, nope, that just happened. Just, you need to get over it. Um, and it wasn't, and you know, at that point in my life, when I had gone to that conference, I had some clinical knowledge, you know, and some self-awareness that I hadn't had as a youth. And I really wish I had, but as you guys know, as you learn and you grow, you become more aware. Um, and you're just like, oh shit. Yeah. I got to deal with this. Like I haven't dealt with this yet. Yeah. The let things me, you don't do this work. Yeah, the things you don't deal with come back to bite you in the ass in a big way a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and that's and that's trauma. And, and it's interesting, you know, when I lost my brother, it was a traumatic experience. And and I learned right then and there, trauma breeds trauma. It, you know, it, so, so things that I hadn't seen in my dreams in a long time suddenly were back. You know, so it, it really it's in your body it's there and you've uh, got to learn how to deal with it um i just i i wanted to go to if, if, if it's okay i just wanted to ask about your brother yeah um, did did it might he, make me cry okay. <laughs> that's that's, okay. that's okay that's okay i just <laughs> if it's okay if you if yeah, you're willing please. to talk about him did, i love talking about him how what happens um what happens if you don't mind me asking so um, my brother died in a four-wheeler accident in front of my house. Oh, and, Jesus. Um, I found him. Oh, my God. Uh. So um, I was laying in bed, and I had heard a noise, and I didn't know what it was. I thought my dog had, like, slipped down the stairs. You know what I mean? It was just – so I, I went downstairs. The dog was fine. I looked out the front window, and I didn't see Michael at first. But his four-wheeler was upright in my driveway. And I'm like, and I didn't know whose four wheeler it was, you know, it's, it's nine 30, 10 o'clock at night. Um, so I'm flipping on all my outside lights. I'm thinking, well, maybe somebody's trying to get into my, my back garage. Um, and then I saw Michael in the road. 
Oh, Jesus. Um, and so, um, you were like the poster child for trauma. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, I went to him, um, I yelled of course, and I live kind of in the middle of nowhere and I was afraid to leave him in the middle of the road because I didn't want anybody to hit him. And another car had come up, one of my neighbors, and they stayed with Michael when I ran inside to get my phone and call 911. Um, he officially died uh, the next morning, but he had broke his brain stem. So he was, um, there was no, you know, no way he was going to make it. And he was, you know, I'm really um, blessed to have had him for 40 years. He was an amazing big brother and he listened to me all the time. And he knew all my shit. And, um, you know, it was really hard. It's still really hard to not have him here with us. And I think this year I hit the age he was, or last year, I hit the age he was when he died. So I, I was 42 in November. Wow. And, um, and it was really hard for me to go be older than him. <laughs> you know, it was just <laughs> this really weird feeling of, wait a minute. You know, so yeah. Um, wow. And, I'm... You know, I went straight to the VA. <laughs> that that next day, I called my VA doc, and I was like, "I need to come see you. Like, I I can't do this." Um, and it was. It, it's a lot of you know. And I, I'm grateful for the fact that I already had my VA doc. I already had a lot of knowledge about trauma. I already knew, you know, what I mean. A lot of the tools and the tricks and the things you needed to do to get through because I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have that, you know, I would have been starting from square one on that day. And I wasn't. That's Um, that kind of actually, you just kind of led into my next question actually, because I'm really curious to see how all of this kind of came full circle and how you came to AFSP and stuff. And like, was it, did you, did, did your experiences push you into mental health like, what is your background as far as coming in into the profession? So I was a career advisor in the military, which kind of pans out to guidance counselor to 200 grown men, which is okay. kind of like herding cats. Um, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> uh, you mean kittens. And, <laughs> and we were the most deployed squadron in the Air Force Reserve. So okay. my guys had a lot of stuff, you know, so when they came home, Wow. Um, there was a lot of issues there, you know, whether it be substance abuse, domestic abuse, um, and, and things like that. So I learned a lot from them. And then I, I took a safe talk training. Oh, you know, yes. Um, yep. And so, which was um, started kind of my, okay, wait a minute, there's, there's more out there and there's more we can do. And I, I recognize too, in the military, your hands are very tied on what they will allow you to do when it comes to bringing in suicide prevention. You know, this is our model and we're sticking with it and you can't do anything more about it. And I wanted to do more and I couldn't do it in the military. So I decided to, you know, I worked with Heroes at Home for a while out of Rensselaer County. That's a veterans peer support program. Um, And then I started volunteering with AFSP. And it was actually a girlfriend of mine who was on the board at that time. She's like, you know what, Kate, I think you'd get a lot out of this. And so I started and then, you know, it was kind of fast tracked for me. I got on the board and, you know, two, two and a half years later, I was board chair. Um, But that's always been my mentality too. And, you know, strong point, but also a weakness. I dive in. (laughs) Like if I'm in, I'm in. Yeah. Um, I wish I could have worked with you more as board chair. Yeah. I love love Dan. I love Dan, but I just wish I had had gotten the chance to have more experience with you. Well, anytime. Well, you got questions or you want, you know, you just let me know. Um, All right. I appreciate that. But yeah, you know, and I, I dove straight in and I also burned myself out, you know, cause there's that, that weighing things. Um, but I know, especially after Michael died, I dove straight into a lot of different things because I just didn't want to deal, you know? And, and so I, I worked like a champ and it affected me, you know, it affected my health. And, um, 
I had been sober for two years before more Michael died. And then the year he died, I just, I had at it for a while and I've been sober for two and a half years now. Um, Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, We're learning you know, a lot about sobriety because Tim and I are co-facilitating a, a peer group at a recovery center in Saratoga. Oh, great. Has, and it's, it's try, you know, it's for mental health, but we, it's, it's in a recovery center. So a lot of the people that are coming in are either in the program or, or need programming that, right. that is necessary to, to help them out. So that's awesome. That that's awesome that you've got two and a half years again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Now, so I, I got to ask this because I mean, obviously the American foundation for suicide prevention. So obviously you've have you, do you still have, do you still contemplate? Do you still have the ideations? Did you have the ideations? Like, did you, did you make an attempt or was it just something that you just felt that you could, you could get? I had ideations, um, throughout, you know, since my rape, since Michael died. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful to say they were only ideations, you know, and, and I don't mean to minimize that either. Um, but you know, those thoughts of, I just don't want to be here anymore. I never had a plan. You know, it was just kind of those, those thoughts. Um, and for me being able, I suck at vulnerability. <laughs> like that was, you know, that was my big kind of, um, downfall is nope, I've got this. I'm not vulnerable. I've, you know, I'm carrying on. And for me, like I, it's, you know, part of my story is kind of laying down, literally laying on Michael's grave and bawling and saying, okay, I can't do this. That was a cathartic moment. <laughs> I, I can't explain it any better than just getting up and being relieved that I could finally admit that, that I wow. just wasn't strong enough to do this on my own. And I got, I got chills as you just said that actually. Yeah. It, it really you know, and I've tried to explain it to a couple different people. And I'm like, I don't, I can't explain that feeling. It just was a, a relief, like just being able to say that, you know, to, to his grave and to him, I know he's with me, you know, that I, fuck man, I can't do this. You have to help me because I don't want to do this anymore. Um, was huge. It was a huge vulnerable moment and I needed it. And with that, and I, I know when I need to go talk to him, I can feel it. I get anxious. I get pissy. I, you know, I can just feel it coming, you know, and, and it is, I just go up there and I fall. I scared some two old men the other day. <laughs> I'm up there with my whoopee, which is my military blanket. I'm laying on my whoopee. I'm bald. These poor guys. Oh, are, no. Jim, are you okay? Yeah, I'm all right. Now. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah, I'm just letting it out, man. You know, um, that's tears awesome. Of, <laughs> it's, tears of the washing machine for the soul. Yes, they are. Out, that's you know, that is an awesome. That is so awesome. I love that. It's amazing <laughs> what it's amazing what just admitting to whatever energy source that you yep. that you draw from that you can't do it anymore. Yeah, and I. I I've had some experiences like we had an experience recently at our group that proves to me that if you ask for the right thing at the right time and you put yourself in that position, it will be, it will be granted regardless of what you believe. Cause I'm not, I'm, right. I'm very irreligious, but I'm a, but I, but I glean things from the wisdom traditions because there's mm -hmm. good things to be had there, but right. I really do believe in energy circulation and what you get and put out you get back regardless you know, but, of whether it's good or bad <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a there's another side to that coin though because as kate was saying you know speaking about you know at, you know saying you can't do this on your own and stuff like i you know when i was at that point i was said it 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 actually made it worse for me because it was more weight like just okay. something else that I failed at and like, like something to be shameful for or something. Yes. Shame for? Shame. Okay. Boom. Yeah. Okay. Shame. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. You know what I mean? It's not, um, 
as we all know, it's not a one size fits all, you know? Right. Right. And it depends on where you are in your journey too. I mean, obviously I, I have to assume that shame for, for Kate has probably been an ongoing thing to where she's probably had enough of it that she's able to like now be able to befriend to it. it. Yeah. To befriend <laughs> it a little bit, to at least be able to let it go enough to kind of try to pat it on its way a little bit. Yeah. But, wow. I think, is, uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, it's interesting you said it like that. I, I had gone to a women's veterans yoga retreat completely out of my comfort level, you know? Like, yeah, I was going to say, like, huh? Not really my thing. <laughs> um, you know, I walked in and it was a mixture of like Woodstock meets dirty dancing retreat thing. And <laughs> like, oh my God, dude, what, what the frick did I get myself into? Nobody um, put the baby in a corner. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, I have to say it was in the most kind of, uh, it was a great week. You know, by the end of the week, I didn't want to leave. When I first got there, I'm like, what the hell is tofu? Like, I'm not eating this. Um, <laughs> but but one of the things they had talked about, because it was all, you know, all of us female veterans had PTSD from something or another. You know, it wasn't all military sexual trauma. There were, I had medics there who were on the front lines of Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, some amazing women, you know, and their stories were just amazing. But one of the things they had said to, to us, you know, is you got to sit with your shit and none of us like to do that. And, and our own worst enemy is usually ourselves. It's that inner voice that's talking to us and telling us all these untruths. And, you know, and that's what they are most of the time is untruths. And so it was, you know, invite your inner person to coffee and what are you going to tell them? And it was really kind of an interesting exercise of, all right, that voice that's telling me I should be ashamed of what happened, or it's my fault, or this or that, what, do you, what would you tell them? If you could sit them down like they were your friend coming to talk to you about how they're feeling, you know, that same thing of, that's not true you know, and I shouldn't feel that way. And, and so it was kind of an interesting dynamic and, and change of, of how to look at things that I, I got a lot out of that. And I still do it when I, you know, doubtful about certain things of, okay, what would I tell, you know, invite my inner self to tea and coffee or whatever and tell them to shut the F up. Right. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it can be really, you know, it can be helpful to try that. That's a good one. I like that a lot. Yeah, there's yeah. something about dealing with the inner child and or whatever you call it, the you know, yep. the inner the inner part of your being or whatever. What are some things that you do, you know, maybe you have some uh, daily routines or what are some things that you do now to keep you um I guess in check, we'll say, or on the wellness side of the spectrum. On the wellness, yeah. So um, they vary, right? Some days that could be literally binging Law and Order for a few hours, the okay. old series, you know. S um, SVU? No, uh, no, oh. that one freaks me out a little oh, bit. Like, okay. the, yeah, like yeah, I'm sure that probably school. hits a little close to home. Yeah, yeah, that's a little too close to home. But like the right. old school Law and Orders, you know, with Briscoe and, you know, like that I've seen a okay. hundred thousand times. Um and, you know, um, my, I have a 20 year old son who's absolutely amazing and, um, I am so grateful for him. So, um, and he's upstairs sleeping right now because God forbid <laughs> he gets up before 10 AM on a weekend, but, um, you know, spending time with him, checking in with friends and family. Um, I have great parents. They're awesome. And, um, they live not far up the road and, and then just doing things that, you know, I, I've gotten crafty lately, which is so not me. And I've started cooking, which again, so not me, COVID cooking and crafting. <laughs> um, so, but my son's really happy because like we're eating really decent food now versus, <laughs> you know, let me warm this up for you, man. Um, you know, I think it's just, I know to reach out to people and I, I have great supports. So it, it's just keeping, I have to keep myself engaged. COVID and, and I could get along really well because I can recluse like the best of them. And that's not always the best thing. Um, so for me, it's, it's being self-aware of, okay, Kate, you're reclusing a little too much, you know? And, and my therapist used to say that she's like, it's all right if you binge watch stuff for a couple of days, just be aware of where you're at that you're right. not not doing things because of your trauma or because you're feeling this or that. And so, 
you know, I have to, I have to push myself sometimes like, okay, you need to go there. <laughs> you know, like you need to go visit with these people. And of course COVID makes it a little difficult, but, but doing those things, I have to push myself. So, um, but yeah, just, I have an awesome dog. And although she's not technically a therapy dog, she is. So, right. you know, I think all her. animals, I think all animals are therapy animals, regardless of whether they got a little tag on them or not. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. She, she knows, you know, and she'll curl up with me. And, um, right now I'm watching a woodchuck in the backyard, which <laughs> I was going to attempt to trap, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Somehow I can't picture you to be the yoga the yoga, yoga gal yeah. oh well i'll send you a picture i'm in a yoga pose it's oh my like, god yeah. <laughs> send it send it we'll use it to advertise the uh, episode <laughs> <laughs> it'll be it'll be called katie's covid cooking and cleaning and yoga and crafting and yoga <laughs> yeah. yeah or sorry yeah, crafting hiking. yes hiking was a big thing for me for a long time um i haven't been out as much as i'd like to but that was another thing that that brought me so much clarity just throw it and I live um Mount Greylock isn't a far drive for me in mass so you know that has I used to trail run there and and for me that was also kind of taking back my power because trail running by yourself in the middle of the woods can be a slightly scary experience right so for me to be able to do that was like nice. haha <laughs> right I've got this I'm not scared to do this um, a little so exposure therapy yeah yep gotcha definitely I like it Wow. What do you, do you have any um uh I guess words insight or um I don't know insert whatever word you want there for for the because going back to what you said earlier which I think most of us know that um rather disgusting number of 22 per day yeah. uh, do you have any kind of um again words or insight to for that like is there something that you think that you know i know there's not just one thing but if if there's like some things that you think that could help decrease these numbers i think you know if we look at the military to change it's not going to happen right? right so it's it's recognizing and and one of the biggest struggles for guys when they get out is that loss of camaraderie you know, because even though the military is the military and there's a lot of BS and, you know, you're, you know, sure. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you still have each other. And so you all have each other to, com you know, comparative suffering throughout the day of how bad was your day, but you had each other, you know? And so when you get out, you lose a, such a huge portion of that. And so I think for anyone, any vet, or, and especially those who are struggling, you know, checking in, check in on your wingman, check in on your people, get together, right. do a, keep that camaraderie alive. Cause once that's gone, that's where a lot of these guys really fall out. Um, and the VA system, again, I was lucky, but I have, I have friends who are not so lucky and dealing with them. It almost feels like at sometimes they make it hard. So you do give up because no, they I definitely think that they, you do. know, they don't want to give you, you know, your benefits or they don't want to hook you up with this doctor and, and it can really feel that way. And, and so, um, you know, it took me two years to do my compensation two years before they approved it. Um, of going back and forth and I could have given up most definitely, but I that's didn't. What they, that's what they wanted you to do. I, it uh, feels that way. It really does. You know, they make it difficult. And so, you know, having those supports, you know, again, whether it be friends or family members, other military members, I, I have two my old officers that I constantly, you know, we constantly check in on each other and just joke and share really disgusting memes and <laughs> things that are horribly inappropriate, but fun and remind us of when we were all together, you know, and, and if I didn't have that, I'd, I'd be at a loss, you know, so, so keeping those connections alive and, and reaching out if you need help. And maybe that's not the VA and I get that you know, but there's a lot of groups out there that are willing to help. It's just finding where you're comfortable. Cause some groups I'm in, I'm like, I don't know, a little much for me, you know, I mean, so 
so figuring out what's your cocktail, you know, what's going to work for you. Is it a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but not expecting the military to step in and do anything. Cause they're not gonna, right. you know, right. they're there right. to check the box. Oh, we gave you that training. You took suicide prevention training. You're good. We're out, <laughs> you know? Yep. Um, and that's unfortunately been the way it has been for years. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. No, probably not. You're probably right. And I think yeah, that that's a big part of the problem too, is that I I've spoken to, to different people with different mentalities of what their service was. And, yeah. and, uh, I had a gentleman at my house, very nice guy, but told me straight out that a guy like me causes a guy like him to die because yeah. empathy, empath there is no empathy. Right. Empathy is a weakness. And when you're constantly like when that is when you're taught that it, it makes it very hard for anybody to 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 undo to change it. to undo it. But yeah. so that kind of leads me to that question. Like, I mean, is there hope for I mean, is there hope for for the for people in the military that are dealing with with these issues? I mean, or is it up to us is. as a or is it up to us as a society to to help and not not exactly involve the institutions i think there's hope you know I, well though there's always hope right right um, i mean yeah i mean we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for hope right um i think it's up to us as a society you know to try and rely on the military to change how they're doing things um because you know your friend was right in some of those jobs yeah yeah, you can't be, you know, super squishy, right? It's right. Not, yeah, it's no, not I get it. Work, you know, but my father as a combat vet who was, you know, infantry was still able to get help. And so I think there, there's a really good example of, yes, it can happen. It's knowing in ourselves that we need it. Um, instead of shutting down. And so now how do you get to those people that are shutting down? You know, I mean, it's just such a huge um, kind of look at it logistically and like, all right, how do we get there? And so there's groups doing peer mentoring in, in communities and is that it? Or do we need to bring this back? Like, you know, VFWs and American Legions when I were a kid, was a kid were rocking. You know, that was the place where all these guys got together and really talked and and had that camaraderie and now they barely exist you know so do we need to go back to that kind of grassroots and is that even possible now and i don't you know i don't have the answer i wish i did i i, um, have, an, I have another question that kind of poses though because obviously when you when you get out of the military regardless of whether whether it's retirement or you do your two four years however the service runs what does that say though about us civilians dealing with veterans is there is there a place for us to help veterans or is it or is it not necessarily um, are they not going to accept help from somebody like me who because I'm curious because we talk about we talk about unregulated people walking around yep. society because there's an awful lot of unregulated people walking around in society. Right. An awful lot of us that have suffered trauma, regardless of whether it's from your military service or from your childhood right. or whatever, that we're carrying around all these things. Is it is I mean, like, is there a danger? Is there like it's just kind of curious to know like where we stand with some people, because obviously there's a lot more people walking around society that don't acknowledge these things. Right. So trying to figure out the best way to answer that. Um, I think, you know, civilians, non-military people can definitely help veterans. I think there's an absolute comfort level though, from a vet talking to a vet. Oh, absolutely. That we cannot, you know, that you cannot give to someone else. That, that you cannot give to someone that. else. And it's interesting, you know, and it kind of makes me think about something. I had gone to, um, I was talking to two guys who were both combat vets 
um, OIF, OEF, so recent combat vets. And we were talking about trauma. And it's, it's interesting you kind of brought that up. So my trauma, although experienced while well in the military, is not combat trauma. So, you know, I would feel a little guilty talking to them about having PTSD because I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't comparatively talk to them about what they had experienced. Right. That's all. That's I'm so happy you brought that up. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. You know, so I struggled with that. So, you know, these two guys were both frontline guys, infantry men who'd seen some pretty hairy shit. And here I am with my trauma and, and not to discount mine, but I would right. feel like it was, you know, like I can't compare to this. So I think regardless of military or not, there's still that, you know, if your trauma is this or that trauma is trauma, you know, yes. what we, you know, what we experience yes. may be a little bit different and our nightmares may vary. Yes. And uh, our, I like that. Our, nightmares may vary. You know, our <laughs> triggers may vary, but in reality, it, it's, it's trauma is trauma. Thank so, you. Thank you. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I love that because I, I've been, I've said that for so long and I've been trying to convey it in the words that you just did. Um, so thank you because I 110% fully agree and stand by that for sure. There's too much comparison. There's too much not working together. Like, you know, well, you know, I suffered more. Well, I, I, I live with this and I, my diagnosis, is that, you know, it's like, shut up. We're all in this together. We're all trying to, to, achieve the same thing so if we can work together as a team guess what it's going to come out you know quicker maybe or better or other ideas it's just it's nonsense it's nonsense yeah i don't know if that actually answered your question though will but i'm so glad we went on that topic <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, yeah, that was, yeah i mean as i as and obviously being in out in society you come into so you you meet so many different people and i've had the i've had the great experience of just being able to meet so many different people and talk to them so it's i always try to find a way to relate but i've had some conversations i have a close friend of mine who's who's still in uh and and has a has a, a job and still he's still in there and i talk to him quite a bit and i've met some other people through him and it's i i've it's interesting that i can tell that even though i have the experience of you know knowing what all these problems are i i still can't quite relate reach. to them right yeah. you still can't quite reach and i wonder if I, I suppose, and, and maybe it's just my self-worthiness of, is it, is, is it worth me trying to reach or just to be like, Hey, you know, it's all good, you know, without, without getting too deep into it. it you know, I don't know what, I think everybody's different too, yeah. you know, and I think it's, it's that recognizing, like Tim just said, trauma is trauma. Like we're, we're all in this together and we're all kind of, on our journeys and our journeys might look different, but our shit's the same, you know? So that took me some time to recognize still, you know, when I look at combat vets and what they, you know, some of these guys have gone through, but I have a good friend who's a combat vet and, and has been a confidant of mine for many years. And, you know, he and I can talk really openly about where we're at. And, and so I so appreciate that because I know what he saw is not what I went through. But again, our stuff's the same. At the end of the day, our stuff is the same. And so, you know, we're all different. And it's hard to, to say that, yes, this will reach all of us. Because there is no one size, like Tim said, no one size fits all, you know, when it comes to that stuff. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing all of yeah. this with us and our listeners, man. Um, it's such an honor to have you be here for Veterans Day and, and just to have you here just in general. So thank you for still being here. Like that is the, that is just huge because with all the weight you've carried around with you, the fact that you still are vertical and you're still above ground is, isn't it, is a testament to, to resilience and hope. And that's what we always try to like, when we do, we bring people on to tell their story. That's what we want. And I, I don't think anybody has embodied that greater 
and yourself for your for with with your story and just being as honest and open with it as as you have been it's funny uh well we we you know we have talked you know when we get guests on or even just re our regular episodes without um the above ground conversation part of it uh i i we always kind of say like it, it would be great to reach like one person and and if someone, you know, whether or not they thank us or not, it's fine. But it, just to just to be able to reach somebody and say and have them say like, oh, wow, this specific thing was awesome that you said and I do it and it helps. Um, it, it's funny because this aspect, I'm viewing it in a little bit of a different light because Kate said that this is her first time like sharing the story, basically. So I, I feel like we may have contributed a little bit to her, um, you know, we, we helped her process a little bit instead of like somebody out there that we don't know. I don't know. That's just my like take on it, I guess. But I was just going to say that if, if you hit one person, you hit me. So, <laughs> so, thank, you. so thank you for that. You guys no, thank you for, for being open and honest and, and having this courageous story and, and showing your strength and resiliency. It's, it's, uh, it's inspiring. And, and I'm sure it's, it, you know, it's going to hit somebody else out there for sure. There's no doubt. Well, I am incredibly proud to be above ground with both of you today and, and moving forward. And I, I can't thank you enough for this. Uh, awesome. th there's, there's no reason to thank us, but you know what you are going to do. We oh, asked, no. <laughs> we asked, we asked, <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we ask uh, uh, three questions at the end of every podcast, and um, okay, <laughs> and there's there's two semi serious questions, and one in the middle of that is not necessarily as serious, but okay. is serious is serious to everybody because everybody's different. But uh, but uh, I'm gonna let Tim ask the first question. <laughs> oh All right. boy, no, it's not it's not bad. All right, Kate. So, do you have a favorite or a least favorite word? Um, let's see. My father used to use, um, and now I'm completely brain dumping on it. Um, oh, it's so bothersome because it was like my favorite word. He'd call people this bad name, but it really isn't a bad word. <laughs> um, and now I'm like, touch hole. You... There it is. Oh. <laughs> I am so, like, hey, I'm so grateful that you remember. <laughs> oh, me too. Because that is Touch classic. Love that. You got, yeah. Love that. That's, that's a classic cool. word for us to like, not <laughs> that we use it, but that just, that just, that's perfect for this yeah. show. Can so you get the award for, for best word? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking touch hole. That was, touch I love hole. that. So yes, there's my favorite word. Uh, okay. Do you have a least favorite or no? No, I'm good. I okay. Yeah, no, nothing All really right. throws me off there. Good. And I think I know the answer to this, but there could be more to this. So, cat, dog, or other? I am a dog girl. I don't mind cats. Oh, and I'll tell you, kind of a this is a funny story, right? So, my brother lived two houses down the road from me, and um, his cat comes to visit every once in a while. So, I'm standing on my, out, looking out the window the other like it was a while ago, and here comes his name is Cat. Michael wasn't very creative in naming, <laughs> and so I'm like, oh look, cat's coming to visit. You know, I'm I'm getting all warm and fuzzy inside. I'm like, oh my brother's cat. The freaking thing turned around and peed on, like, sprayed my bench. See, I, I, I say cats are evil. I told you, I'm well, like, there's proof. No. What the, you know, so here, it's like this warm, touching moment. You're like, oh, my brother's cat. Oh, it was warm. It was warm yeah. and touching. And then I'm watching it back up. I'm like, what is it doing? And then it lifts its tail. I'm like, wait, what? No, no. <laughs> That's so, great. Definitely. That's perfect. That's yeah. so cat-like. <laughs> More of a dog girl myself. Cats, I have a yell. <laughs> cats or touch holes? Yes. Oh, yes. you stop Amazing. it now. Yes. <laughs> I'm sending. I'm sending Fernando your way. <laughs> I'm sending Fernando your way. Fernando knows that we, we have boundaries. Fernando knows that, <laughs> that that cushion is his. This cushion is mine. That's it. <sighs> so, so we have one one last question for you, Kate. It is. Okay. Um, something that we always ask everybody um if there was one thing 
or a, a series of things, I guess, that you could do for mental health as a whole without any com- kind of restraint on it, what would it be? Normalizing it, but I don't, you know, I, I know that's such yeah. a generalized answer. And, and then if you no. would ask me how I do that, I'd have no idea or I'd have a lot of little ideas, but I think we really need to normalize it and that it's not this big, scary, taboo thing. We need to be able to talk about it. We need to be able to, to feel our shit and, and be able to talk about that without feeling like we're going to get judged for it or that we're going to lose our job for it or that we're going to be institutionalized or something else, you know, make it less scary and, and more normal. Perfect. And I think, I think with this conversation, we actually made one more step to having it become normal. Yeah, I hope so. For sure. I think thank you so much. I think with every conversation, that we try to do that. And I, I cannot thank you enough for, for being this, having this be the first place that you've told this story to. And I, I just, I can't, I can't thank you enough and I can't virtually hug you enough uh, just for being, <laughs> just for being, just for being here and having the strength to stay, man. That, that's yes. just, that's huge. So thank huge. You. Thank um, you if, so much. If you don't mind, can you hang out for a few minutes I while I have. while I close down here? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much for everybody that listened. I hope everyone out there heard Kate's story. And um, if if anybody needs to reach out, please find your wingman, your battle buddy, your struggle buddy. Find find that person that can hold space for you because there's help out there, and. There is no reason that we need to lose 22 vets a day to suicide. There's no No. reason that we need to lose anyone to suicide, but there's no reason that we need to, to keep this on. We need to keep this out in the forefront and that everybody is struggling and that, that people need to get reach out, be able to reach out for help. And if they can't reach out for help, maybe someone can reach out to them. And they, and they actually can uh, email us, right? Well, Absolutely. You can email us at abovegroundpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can find us on social media at Above Ground Podcast for everything Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, don't forget abovegroundpodcast.net. Um, January 2021, we're going to be hopefully introducing some new stuff. We're going to have some, we're, we've got some plans going on, man. 2021 is going to be a, is going to be an awesome year. It's going to um, be our year, man. Our Rock. year. Every year, year is our every year is our year. Every year, year above year. ground is a is a year. You know what I so mean. So if you guys if you guys and gals like the uh, program that we do, the uh, entertainment that we provide, the um, support we try to um, provide, you can always um, share, star, subscribe. That whole uh, you know write write a little review if you liked it. It always helps us. It helps uh, other people find the podcast and. and um, so it, it, you know, it's, it's always a good thing. Absolutely. Timmy. Thank you. So until next week, man, be well, be safe, be above. above.